Okay, it's six o'clock, so I think we should get rolling here. Carrie, are you ready? I'm going to introduce you first, but okay, good. All right. Well, hello and welcome to the Extreme History Project Lecture Series. My name is Crystal Alegria, and I am the director of the Extreme History Project. Our mission is to make history relevant, and we do that through this lecture series, historic walking tours and historic bus tours, and most recently, a podcast called The Dirt on the Past. Check that out wherever you find your podcasts. I do have a few housekeeping tips before we begin. We are in webinar format tonight, so you can hear us, but we can, can't hear you. So if you have qu questions for Carrie, write those in the question and answer box that you can access at the bottom of the screen. If you have thoughts and comments, you can also use the chat button also located at the bottom of the screen. At the end of Carrie's presentation, you can ask questions and I will, um, you can ask questions in the question and answer and I will read those for Carrie. But if a question pops up during the presentation, go ahead and write that in and we'll address it at the end. A big thank you to our sponsor this evening, Vicki York. Thank you so much, Vicki, for sponsoring. We are grateful to our sponsors. They really help us make this lecture series possible. So thank you, Vicki. I know you're out there this evening, so thank you. Right now at the Extreme History Office, we are gearing up for walking tour season. We are so excited because we didn't get a full walking tour season last summer. So we are itching to do some walking tours this summer. The tours will begin Memorial Day weekend starting May 28th, Friday, May 28th. If you would like to schedule a walking tour, please visit our walking tour website, which is adventurethroughtime.org. And if you can't remember that, just go to our Extreme History Project website and at the top, you can click on our walking tours and you'll find that the link to that website. The Extreme History Headquarters building, which is located right here in Bozeman um, at 234 East Mendenhall is open on Thursdays and Fridays from 10 to three. So come in and visit us if you're in the Bozeman area. We still have our um, exhibit on reproductive health in 1900s Montana. We still have that display up. So if you would like to come in and see that, it'll be up through about June, and then we're gonna switch it out. So make sure to come and see that before you lose your chance. If you enjoy this lecture series and all of our extreme history programming, we would love your support. We are a nonprofit funded by our community, which is of course all of you out there tonight on Zoom. So please consider becoming a member of the Extreme History Project or making a donation on our website. And if you are Venmo savvy, um, you could throw a few bucks our way via Venmo. So Cheryl is gonna put all of that information in the chat box and you can just grab that information, the link to our website, our Venmo information and, and send a few dollars our way, we would sure appreciate it. It really helps us continue to do what we do. I'm so excited to introduce our speaker this evening, Carrie Clement. Carrie is a fifth year PhD candidate at the University of Colorado, Colorado, Colorado in Boulder in the history department there, where she is currently writing a dissertation on disease, animals, and indigenous and settler borderlands in Montana. Carrie is interested in applying history to contemporary issues, I love that. Clear and concise communication with the public audience is the cornerstone of her research and community-based work. She has experience in the digital humanities and public history, which are two avenues which she often combines where she has worked in the service of applying and communicating history. So we're so glad to have you here tonight. Welcome, Carrie, and take it away. Thank you, and, and thank you for having me. Hopefully I can live up to that <laughs> excellent introduction um, uh, without bungling it too badly. Um, so before I get started, I just need to um, acknowledge that the University of Colorado Boulder occupies lands whose original and rightful stewards include the Cheyenne, Arapaho, and Ute Nations. Furthermore, I am currently located and have conducted much of the research I'm sharing with you today um, in the homelands of the Great Sioux Nations, Cheyenne, Shoshone-Bannock, Salish Kootenai Nations, and of course, 
the Absalaga or Crow nation. The unlawful removal and continued displacement of these and other nations enables the rest of us to continue to live and work here. Um, so like Crystal said, I am a uh, fifth year PhD candidate at CU Boulder. Um, just as a really quick uh, backstory, I am a fourth generation settler Montanan. Um, I have two degrees from Montana State University. Um, and this is a project that originated out of a research um, seminar that I did while in Colorado. Um, so what's really interesting is I, or I left Montana and, and most of my research has continued to uh, involve Montana in some form or fashion. Today, I'm gonna to be talking to you about a short-lived program um, on the Crow Reservation during the 1930s. This program was led by Robert Yellowtail, um, one of the first indigenous superintendents ever, uh, and the first Crow superintendent of the Crow Reservation. Um, what Robert Yellowtail did with these programs is he sought to restore decimated horse herds um, after decades of horse reduction programs at the behest of local ranchers and federal agents. Uh, Yellowtail's, just really quickly, Yellowtail's program is a spoiler alert. Um, Yellowtail's programs resulted in high and bred horses um, coming to the reservation during the 1930s, but by the 1940s, the program was essentially uh, defunct. And so what I'm going to talk about today um, as I will cover sort of the backstory about why this program was needed in the first place, and then the horses that he was able to bring in during the 1930s, and then some contributing factors as to why the program essentially fizzled out by 1940. Um, and I'll throw in some greater horse breeding history as well, because that is to a certain point um, important to understand some of the intricacies of uh, the program during the 1930s. And also I enjoy talking about horse history. So um, there's that. Before I get started really quickly, I need to thank folks who've been critical to this research um, and, and I wouldn't have been able to do it without them. It includes Robert Yellowtail's daughter, as well as Tim McCleary, Brianna the uh, Theobald, Steve Fountain and Cody White at National Archives, as well as my patient and long suffering language teachers at the Crow Summer Institutes including, including Rowan Hill and Velma Peace. Um, so you can see there, here is a photograph of Robert Yellowtail um, at Crow Fair sometime between 1934 and 1939 officially, although if I had to put a strong guess on it, I would guess probably 1937. Um, so here's what I'm just gonna cover, like I said, really quickly, uh, the background. Um, I can't cover the entirety of Crow history, <laughs> um, no, so what I'm going to be doing instead is concentrating on the history as it pertains to the story. Um, if you want to learn more about Crow history more generally, generally, I would recommend checking out Little Bighorn College Facebook Live archives. Um, they have pres excellent presentations uh, almost every week um, and just have a wealth of knowledge there, as well as past lectures hosted by the Extreme History Project. I'll go over briefly Robert Yellowtail and his life, and then the horses themselves, and then what happened to the program. So, um, like the relationship to the land upon which the Crow Reservation is now located, um, the relationship between crows and horses has a deep historical and cultural roots, or has deep historical and cultural roots. Joe Medicine Crow, um, some of you may be familiar with that name, a prominent tribal historian and nephew uh, to Robert Yellowtail um, says, dates the introduction between horses and uh, crows somewhere around 19, or se excuse me, 1725 to 1730. Um, once crows acquired and began integrating uh, horses into their culture, it really, you know, it, it very much sort of took off. Um, into cultural, social, and material power. Medicine Crow asserts that crows realized the usefulness of the new animals and quickly tied their wealth and prestige and social prestige um, to their horses and their horse herds. The horses themselves became critical players in hunting, trading, and raiding activities um, 
in pre-reservation era history. Horses played integral roles in Crow um, social relationships, like I said, including marriages, adoptions, criminal law, family structures, and extra tribal relations. Um, for example, one rite of passage for young warriors involved capturing a well-guarded or prized horse from an en enemy nation and bringing it back to his clan. In this way, what's important to our story, in this way, the warrior could demonstrate both his uh, bravery, but then also his horsemanship skills in the same act. Um, horses also played key roles in social ceremonies um, as gifts, including in adoption ceremonies, marriage, and other social and other other ceremonies. Often, the horses presented during these giveaways were prized horses. Horses also connected crows to other indigenous peoples um, during the. 18th and early 19th centuries through raiding and trading, Crow clans acted as intermediaries between Western tribes like the Shoshone and Hadatsa, and later between Euro-American newcomers and regional and other regional tribal members. Joe Medicine Crow identifies these centuries preceding uh, the reservation area era when the Crow had horses. Um, as being the era in which the Crow gained a regional, strong regional reputation as breeders and raider and owners of fine horses. But the relationship extended beyond cultural um, and, well, the, excuse me, the relationship extended beyond economic or sort of trade value as well. It also, the, the Crow equine relationship also was deeply involved in an environmental sense. So for example, one, um, infamous quote that, that is fairly well known, um, but in one infamous quote, a 19th century Crow leader um, asked rhetorically, what is a country without horses? Hence the name of this, this presentation, but what is a country without horses? And then he answered his own question with this explanation where he says, in the autumn, when your horses are fat and strong from the mountain pastures, you can go down into the plains and hunt the buffalo or trap beaver on the streams. And when the winter comes on, you can take shelter in the woody bottoms along the rivers. There you will find buffalo meat for yourselves and cottonwood bark for your horses. Or you may winter in the Wind River Valley where there is salt weed in abundance, end quote, which they would then use to feed um, their horses the salt weed. And so what that shows us um, is the interdependence between crow, the land, and the horses, or the exchanges between the crow land and the horses by marking seasonal and environmental changes by the horses grazing needs, as well as crow um, sort of seasonal changes as well. Essentially, all of these things were interwoven and could not be separated. That brings us up to early reservation history. Um, after several, you know, and I, I'm not doing it justice, but in a quick summary, after several treaties and moves during the course of the 19th century, we can see the, what the crow boundaries are now. And if I can get it to cooperate, you can see here a video taken from the Digital Scholarship Lab at University of Richmond. You can see the Crow Reservation in Montana there shrinking over time until it is essentially what it is now, give or take. Um, extreme history actually has a great uh, background on the first and great research um, on the first Crow Indian Agency, Fort Parker, um, that was founded in 1868 until 1867. So I highly recommend you check that out. Um, the disruption to Crow life and other indigenous nations uh, in the Western United States, Eastern as well, but in the Western United States during the mid 19th century in the federal um, was very much tied to the federal government and settlers suppression of trading and raiding activities. And that obviously coincided with um, Crow's forced restrictions on a much reduced reservation over time. However, rather than losing importance, horses, as one would might expect, horses remain central to Crow reservation economy and to Crow social relationships as well. During this period, horse trading and breeding took on an increased economic importance. Many Crow people made money by selling horses, um, by raising and selling horses then um, was 
even more popular, um, and it will make sense more here in a second why, but even more popular uh, than cattle ranching. Medicine Crow says to be a crow rancher in those days was to raise horses rather than cattle. And they were a primary occupation for many of reservation residents. Uh, but to have horses, you need grass. As the 19th century pro elder I directly identified. Um, and in the late and, and, and in the late 19th and early 20th centuries, or even beyond to some degree, um, local settlers and federal government sought to disrupt that horse grass or horse grazing rather relationship as part of a larger assimilative uh, process within the United States as a whole. Um, and so this assimilation isn't just, uh, isn't just limited to um, the pro, it was, it was across the entire United States, nor was it just limited to agricultural activities, although that was a huge thing. But essentially what happened, in the, in, to summarize it very quickly, too quickly, so I apologize for, um, but to summarize it very quickly, the federal government through various acts as well as other programs that included things like the Dawes Act, as well as um, forced removal for Indian boarding schools or forced removal of indigenous children for uh, boarding schools, um, the federal government sought to foster assimilation through encouraging mandating individualism amongst um, indigenous residents. Um, that also included for many reservations, um, dividing up reservation land. Um, and the Crow history relative to allotment, which is what this dividing up of reservation land and having that land go to individual tribal members instead of having it go to a more collective um, management style as for, or rather for the indigenous nation. Um, the Crow history for that is a little bit different than some of other reservations as is every reservation. Um, but essentially what happens is that over time, follow at the, towards the end of the 19th century, so um, following the Dawes Act, although the Dawes Act did not hit the Crow reservation as hard as in some other reservations, but over time, local ranchers and local stockmen, as well as Montana politicians and federal employees kept trying to find avenues to force allotment and to take um, and to, to sort of begin dividing up the reservation so that it would then open up access to the grazing um, leases and the grazing rights um, on the reservation. Uh, Crow leaders pushed back against these efforts um, for decades until Congress finally stepped in in 1920 with the 1920 Crow Act. Um, the, Crow, uh, the Crow Act divided up the reservation into individually owned tracts of up to 900 acres. Um, the Department of Interior then parceled those out to individual tribal members. Uh, although the act helped to protect Crow land from white ownership, it did limit tribal earnings by forcing Crows to either work the land or lease the land um, to white ranchers and farmers. Uh, and in that sense, it, part of the aim of the 1920 Crow Act was to um, try and force uh, some agri what Euro-American agriculture schemes are set up, if you will, not scheme so much, but set up onto Crow um, families. Grazing leases, um, if a Crow family or a Crow person chose not to um, work their land, which was often very common simply due to the expense entailed in uh, going about <laughs> implementing Euro-American agriculture, um, grazing leases were often utilized by Crow family, uh, families um, in order to use the land or in order to sort of fulfill the 1920 Crow Act. They were a mixed bag. Um, grazing leases ensured some steady income to tribal members, but they also, the grazing leases also required tribal members to relinquish control over their lands to the leaseholders who were by and large white 
ranchers or white stockmen or white livestockmen in some sort of form or fashion. Um, the grazing system, and so you can see here in this photo, um, a crow horse herd from between 1905 to 1911. Um, so this would be an example of some of the horse ranching that occurred before the 1920 Crow Act. Um, the grazing lease system presented a conundrum for the tribe and their animals, uh, particularly their horse and cattle herds, um, especially the horses though. And that was because it created, these grazing leases created um, zones of exclusion where these animals before had much more free roaming, uh, free roaming sort of way of life on the reservation. Um, and now these grazing lease horses, these new, these new grazing leases attempted to bar these animals from these area, from the, the grazing leases. But what's interesting is there was a perception amongst local uh, stockmen and some crow folks, although that is a little bit more complicated, but there was a perception amongst local stockmen and, and federal employees that the range was teeming with horses, that there was an overstocking of the range. Um, numbers are sort of hard to exactly pin down. Um, but reliable estimates place the population at around 40,000 throughout the reservation's 2 million acres. What's important though to remember about these horses is that to a Euro-American agricultural or agriculturalist, rancher, sheep, farmer, um, federal employee, many of these horses would appear to their eye as wild. But in fact, Medicine Crow identified that many of these horses were not, in fact, what we would think of as being wild. But rather, Medicine Crow described in one interview how um, tribal members would sometimes divide herds into separate categories from which they then rotated out individual horses. Um, so for example, the horse or the herd, excuse me, closest to the house consisted of grandma's horses, race horses, rodeo horses, driving teams, and good cow horses. These house herds almost often had the most training and would sometimes carry a brand of their crow owner, but not always. Separate herds in back pastures and in the hills had less interaction um, and had less of a chance of carrying a brand, but they still were rotated in and out of the house herds. And then finally, there was a third herd um, that had the least interaction and therefore, and was often way out there, and therefore its members would appear as wild. But it's important to remember that many of these horses were still rotated in and out. Um, and it's the third herd that Medicine Crow identified as being the ones that were often seen as wild or feral animals on the reservation in the 1910s. So the ones that the range was teeming with. Um, leaseholders, grazing leaseholders, viewed these horses as competitors for the grass. Um, this included, you know, anyway. This included uh, the Snyder Sheep Company um, and other major uh, ranches, including the Matador. No, I'm, anyway, not the Matador, excuse me, but the Snyder Sheep Company. And these large ranches and these large uh, corporations, these agricultural corporations in many ways, um, were complaining that these horses were stealing their grass, essentially. And so what ends up happening is the federal government kind of, and fe or federal employees, excuse me, federal employees sort of see a perfect opportunity in which to uh, combine some of the efforts of the 1920 Crow Act with some other assimilation projects. Um, and that was sort of taken up at the, with extreme vigor by a new superintendent on the reservation in 1919 called Asbury. 
Um, and Asbury was a lifelong Bureau or Office of Indian Affairs employee. He had uh, spent time on other reservations um, and was sort of known for really suppressing uh, cultural and religious activities on reservations. Um, and by suppressing, I mean trying to stamp out indigenous re uh, religion and culture on reservations. And so he was sort of very purposefully brought to the reservation. And so um, he, to sort of really affect pro culture and religion, negatively try, you know, affect pro culture and religion. But he was very, um, he, he was very willing participant in that activities. Um, and one of the things that he chose, one of the programs that he implemented in including out, you know, that were, one of the programs that he implemented was horse herd reductions. And so somewhere between 1919 and 1930, um, the Office of Indian Affairs or the Bureau of Indian Affairs sponsored the destruction of tens of thousands of crow horses um, by, by, through violent means. Um, and these efforts included rounding up horses and shipping them to slaughter or auction, as well as mass killings. Asbury and local officials also implemented a prohibitively expensive tax on branded pro horse her, horses, especially mares and foals, although that was eventually overturned um, by the Montana Supreme Court. Um, why, at first some crow participated by rounding up these range horses and selling them, although, uh, Crow participation in these programs ended um, when Crow elders put an end to it in 1923. Um, Asbury and local producers then had to bring in outside help to replace Crow labor. And white ranchers and, and federal employees began shooting horses for bounty money. And the bounty money, according to one source, was $4 per pair of ears strung on a and which were often strung on a piece of baling wire. In addition to the wild range horses, many branded or in other words, personal horses um, were shipped to the slaughterhouse or shot on the range. And the bounty was paid to whoever, to whoever delivered their ears. Asbury and other BIA employees spoke of attempts to reimburse pro owners at the rate of two or three dollars for these personal horses. But little evidence suggests, I, have been, I haven't been able to find a lot of evidence that the money was actually dispersed to the Crow owners, um, which suggests, you know, which is kind of very suspicious in my mind, but um, yeah. Most Crow, by the end of these programs around 1930, most Crow families um, were left with only a few teams of workhorses um, or some rodeo horses or some, some ranch horses. Um, essentially, the exact toll is impossible to determine, but between 28 and 40,000 horses were sold or shot in just over 10 years time. It's, um, horse, the Crow were not the only reservation and the only indigenous nation to experience programs like this. Um, other tribes, for example, included uh, Diné or Navajo, Cheyenne, and Yakima experienced similar livestock reductions, um, including horses. But these, these stock reductions were traumatic, not just to the Crow people, but it's also important to remember that they would have been traumatic to the horses themselves, um, simply through her dynamic disruption, um, traumatic experience in terms of sensory traumatic experience in terms of loud rail yards, um, getting shot, <laughs> um, cramped trips. Um, etc. And so by like I said, so like by 1930, most of the horses were gone. Um, and so in these photographs, you can see here um, are in the one on the right there, you know, this is a uh, crow, um, this is a crow agriculture, uh, crow, excuse me, 
Apache team. Um, and then over here on the left is some uh, tribal members who are waiting to race in 1910. Um, and then here's some more photographs of pro horses in the 1910s and 1920s. But these, this program was eventually ended due in no small part to uh, lobbying on the part of Robert Yellowtail and other tribal members. In fact, some sources point to Robert Yellowtail as having, um, or Robert Yellowtail's trips to Washington in the 1920s as having a direct effect on Asbury's final, essentially like firing, although it wasn't officially a firing, but he was officially let go um, and in 1930. And so very quickly about Robert Yellowtail, like I said, he was the first pro uh, member to be appointed superintendent as a federal employee. Um, although in, a, um, although when he was appointed in 1934 at his request, the tribe did hold a vote to confirm his appointment, which they did. Um, after he was confirmed in 1934, he immediately began to work on a multi-pronged approach to solve economic or uh, issues on the reservation. Because by this point in time, you know the Great Depression has you know is in full swing, but then also revitalizing cultural uh, cultural programs on the reservation as well. Uh, Yellowtail's appointment and then subsequent approval by the tribe is no uh, accident because like I had sort of gestured to before, um, Yellowtail had acted as an intermediary between uh, federal officials and pro official or pro elders and pro tribal members for, for almost 20 years by the point in time, over 20 years by the point in time when he was appointed in 1934. He was fluent in both pro and English. Um, and he had often traveled, like I said, to Washington DC with tribal leaders during the 1910s. So in the negotiations leading up to the 1920 Crow Act. Um, Yellowtail was born around 1889. Um, he grew up partly on the reservation and partly at boarding school. Um, and earned a law degree by correspondence. He returned home to the ran to the reservation to ranch in 1910, and the ranching his ranching activities included raising thoroughbreds for racing, and he also entered pro politics in that time period as well. And so his work leading up to 1934, he'd essentially uh, garnered a reputation as a shrewd negotiator and politician. Um, but his appointment also marked a shift in federal Indian policy as part of FDR's new administration in the 1930s. And this was, and, and this was part of what was known as the Indian New Deal. Um, the Indian New Deal was a new approach led uh, by John Collier, who you can see in the photograph here on the right, um, who was appointed by FDR uh, at to depart essentially from previous dissimilationist policies. Um, and Collier really emphasized um, or implemented, excuse me, Collier really implemented tribal constitutions, self-determination strategies, and so-called improvement schemes like economic rehabilitation. The actual scorecard on the Indian New Deal is really mixed. Um, the reality of its implement implementation um, has drawn a lot of controversy, rightfully so, because indigenous peoples experienced a lot of negative side effects, such as the prescribed adoption of Euro-American government structures, um, which often did not match complex tribal governance uh, structures already in place. Yellowtail, though, saw opportunities within the Indian New Deal uh, for, for the Pro peoples, um, even if he couldn't, you know, at times sort of ran up against its limitations. And using Indian New Deal, uh, sort of writing on some of the uh, energy of the Indian New Deal, Yellowtail took many, a multi-pronged approach to economic and cultural issues on the reservation. Um, these programs included 
and these efforts and programs included educational reforms, agricultural education uh, programs that also included um, cultural, pro-cultural uh, events as well. Small loans, agricultural loans, road repair, as well as wildlife programs, which included uh, bringing elk in from Yellowstone and bison in from Yellowstone as well. His programs, like I said earlier, also included trying to restore um, the horse herds on the reservation as well. Um, Yellowtail wanted to bring, in particular though, high bred horses onto the reservation. And he wanted to do so because in order to create a, both an economic, but then also cultural uh, revitalization opportunities for Crow tribal members. But the reason, um, but one of the reasons why he wanted in particular high end horses or papered horses or registered horses was because then he could, you know, and tribal other tribal members as well, could then create, could enter the, the horse breeding market in Montana and around the United States. He also wanted high end horses for their breeding possibilities as well. Um, so what's important to know really quickly about horse breeding in the United States is that there had been this growing trend since the late 19th century uh, that emphasized breeding traceability or bloodlines and had and associated purity standards um, associated with breed registries, which many folks who are horse people or you know ranchers or you know sort of know a lot of those registries, uh, but what's really interesting is those registries are not as old as one would think they are. And the breeds are not as old as we would like to, as often as, 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 as the story is woven around these, around these breeds. Um, Americans though, wanted to imbue these, these new, at least in the late 19th century, early 20th century, wanted to imbue these breed registries with prestige and control control then meant you could charge more money for the horse cow, but you could charge more money for the horses. Um, to both stop corruption within the horse trade, but then also there was, a, there was quite a bit of social Darwinism tied up in that as well. Essentially what ends up happening with these breed registries is that uh, purity of bloodlines began to matter more than individual characteristics. And particularly following a major decline in the US horse market following World War I, uh, breed registries began to matter more and more because the only people, or not the only, but um, the, the few remaining horses that could get money in the, the, the crashing horse economy following World War I in the United States were paper horses, largely, or paper horses. Um, and so Yellowtail wanted to access this economy. Um, and he would do so by using his negotiation skills and drawing on several different sources of funding, including government loans, but then also acquiring horses on loan from other government agencies. By the spring of 1936, Yellowtail had purchased or um, had been loaned by other government agencies, a large quantity of pedigreed mares and stallions. So you can see here on the left, on the left, Bottom picture, um, Yellowtail is in a fur coat. It is the one in the fur coat and they're standing in a paddock in winter um, with some of the horses, uh, Corral, excuse me, with some of the registered Morgans that he was able to bring on, which I'll talk very quickly about Morgans here more in a moment. One of his first purchases um, was a Canadian bred Shire Stallion who reportedly weighed over 2,200 pounds and had a really impressive pedigree um, that went back several generations. Um, some of the horses he acquired from other government agencies included a uh, in, included a um, race horse, a thoroughbred race horse from the Army Reet Mount Station in Colorado, uh, and this horse actually placed second in the Kentucky Derby. Um, but and his the horse's name was Bet Mosey, 
but you can, you know, he, he pops up on Google when you Google it. Um, he also, but, you know, he had placed second in the 14 Derby almost 15 years earlier. So by the time he, you know, Bet Mosey arrived on the pro reservation, he was fairly getting on in years. Um, but but Mosey's status as a former racehorse is worth noting because to Yellowtail in 1930s, to Yellowtail, uh, he really be stylized in a 1937 article, the Crow people as a racehorse people, um, and saying that the love for a racehorse in this article, he said that a love for a racehorse has never died down. Um, actually, Yellowtail and his son raced thoroughbreds and raced other horses around the United States on person on their own personal time and their own personal horses um, throughout the 1930s, 1920s, 30s, and 40s. Um, but Yellowtail also wanted to acquire uh, horses that would be useful for ranching and farming on the reservation. Uh, for example, he got on loan to Morgan Stallions from the um, from the U.S. Forest Service, uh, one of which he named Roosevelt, which you can see in the photograph on the bottom right. Um, the two Morgans filled a critical breeding niche on the reservation, um, partly because you know they, the Mor Morgans have a fairly, um, or were stylized rather, excuse me, as a very versatile horse. Um, and they're sort of known as quote unquote, the biggest little horse ever put together. And so Yellowtail really wanted them to work cows and be able to turn, you know, contribute to the agricultural side of the pro economy on the reservation. Yellowtail then, you know, used his sort of formidable uh, negotiation skills and sort of formid formidable uh, marketing skills to then tout the reputation of these horses in local and national publications. Um, and he was doing that to stop, you know, really sort of stylize the crows as readers of fried horses. He would, in these interviews and in these publications, he would really sort of emphasize what each horse really brought to the table and really emphasize the fact that they're high bred, you know, uh, horses. And so he's really trying, you know, really setting himself up and setting up pro horses as, and, and pro herds as herds of fine bred horses. And so this breeding program that he then set up, what would often happen for, especially for some of the studs and the mares is um, crow and people would then use them to start their own smaller herds. Um, and that sort of pops up in oh, some of these uh, marketing uh, marketing things that he undertook. And one of the things that he used to really market these horses and market crow investment in these horses and crow breeding of these horses is um, their usefulness at crow fair or their, their sort of centrality at crow fair during the 1930s. Um, crow fair really briefly has its has roots as an ag agricultural exhibition as part of the assimilation process on the uh, on the part of uh, earlier federal employees, but Yellowtail and other Crow tribal members really uh, have up and really upturned that um, that narrative and that that those efforts, and and it is now in and was then too a very extravagant celebration of Crow culture and one that is often centered around horses, including races, rodeos, dances, and grand parades. Um, Yellowtail also sought and in many ways succeeded in um, converting Crow Fair into a national inf institution and an inform informal Plains Indian conference through his uh, advertising. Um, a grand parade for the uh, for those of you who haven't been to Pro Fair, a grand parade, you know, sort of is, is a daily occurrence and serves as an opening ceremony. And uh, Yellowtail would actually ride 
some of the horses, including Roosevelt, in some of these parades at Crow Fair. He also was really good at like bringing in outside celebrities to help market uh, Crow Fair and market these horses. Um, and so you can see here in this photograph, this is a photograph of um, Yellowtail and, and some family members, as well as um, Western actor Tim McCoy. But by 1938, uh, the relationships that Yellowtail had created with his other federal employees, as well as some of the other, uh, well, some of the, as well as some of the other relationships around these horses were sort of falling apart. Um, this is also just really quickly, this is a photograph as well of Crow Fair um, and Yellowtail is on the paint in the middle. Um, and this is one of the Belgian on the, the upper right photograph. This is one of the Belgian stud stallions that would, um, essentially cover some of these mares for uh, private crow, or for, excuse me, crow tribal members to start their own herds. And so by 1938, oh, here's more crow fair photographs. Um, and so you can see here's a, here's a parade. And then you can also see here um, some working teams in their, in their harnesses um, being led uh, in relation to the parade. Um, but by 1938, uh, like I said, these relationships were often at risk. Um, a captain in the army in charge of the remount, which in which Bet Mosey was a program, essentially repossessed Bet Mosey because he believed that the horse was not being treated correctly. Um, in reality, probably what was happening is he expected the horse to be treated as if it were living in a in a barn in the middle of a city, which means high you know, high, high interaction with other humans, a lot of grooming, et cetera. Whereas Bette Mosey was living his life um, out on the Montana prairie. And so he appeared a lot shaggier, especially in winter than um, the army captain thought ideal. Um, Yellowtail also tried to trade Roosevelt and Monterey to get other horses from Texas. Um, these horses from Texas that he was trying to get onto the reservation would eventually go on to be founding lines on the American Quarter Horse Association. Um, so these were steel dust quarter horses. And so for, but the, our, the Forest Service who technically owned Monterey and Roosevelt, the two Morgan studs said, no, you can't do that. Yellowtail also encountered further resistance from other government officials. Um, who questioned his ability to select horses, his preference for high-end horses, his logic of the breeding programs and his ability to care for the horses. Um, as well as Yellowtail experienced conflict with other tribal members who, and accusations were leveled that Yellowtail used the office to enrich himself and his family. Those charges were eventually dropped, but by 1940, Yellowtail had scaled back his efforts to acquire um, and breed horses and he informed one Wyoming rancher that the horse business in the US is shot and I'm not interested in raising horses anymore. He was correct, but the poor horse market did not remove the cultural meaning and the value of the horses for the Crow Nation. Um, and so really quickly to wrap up, by rebuilding the Crow herds, Yellowtail was working to ensure the continued participation as horses as a, of horses as a key actor in crow heritage and culture, as well as economic and agricultural programs on the reservation. Furthermore, the act of rebuilding the horse herds flew in the face of Asbury's vicious horse reduction programs in the previous decade, decades. Yellowtail's horse building, rebuilding programs worked as a form of political expression to assert Crow identity, sovereignty, and cultural power that was predicated or turned on a close equine human relationship. We don't, I don't know what, excuse me, I don't know really past 1940 what has happened to many of these horses. Um, the textual, their, their, their sort of trace in the textual documents has been lost, but it doesn't necessarily mean um, that many of Yellowtail's efforts were in vain. 
restoration of traditional cultural and social actors, the horses, asserted pro-reputational political and economic power using Euro-American concepts of greed purity. For Yellowtail and other tribal members, these pedigreed horses were an opportunity to rebuild their herds and their reputations as breeders of fine horses. Because for years afterwards, the program continued and these horses continued to receive positive interest. Even if they sort of disappear in the official record, they sort of still appear as being mentioned in some, some, some news stories as well, just in terms of like those horses Yellowtail brought in sort of mentions, um, continue to receive positive interest. Um, and Joseph Medicine Crow described Yellowtail's success with the program when he said pretty soon horses started coming back all over the country after Yellowtail brought in these horses. Medicine Crow continues, families started raising horses again. Crow culture had come back again. Um, and so that's all I realize I'm right at my time. And so that's all I have for you today. I'm happy to answer questions and thank you for listening to me sort of ramble on today. <laughs> Thank you so much, Carrie. Um, if people have questions, they're welcome to put them in the question and answer and um, at, in, or in the chat, either way, I can read them from either place. And so you already have one question, Carrie, and I'll go ahead and, and ask that. It's from Will Wright, who I'm sure you know, Will. <laughs> um, he asked, how does this history speak to the public debates about rematriation rematri of bison to Montana's reservations from Yellowstone National Park? Oh, this is a tough question. And this is a big question. <laughs> um, I think that there's, I think that there's some interesting, I think that there's some significant differences worth noting for the bison debate versus the horse debate. And that is one um, that these horses don't have at least the crow on the Crow Reservation in the 1930s, although I'm going to expand on why I'm being very particular in my language right in a moment, um, were not necessarily counted as wild or feral. It's particularly these high-end bred horses. However, where that begins to get really sticky is when we begin to look at how the federal government and other state governments have grappled with how to deal with the wild horse problem. Um, which even describing it as a wild horse problem is in of in itself a very fraught description. Um, and so essentially when one thinks of these programs, these horse breeding programs in relation to say the wild horse on BLM, so for example, the prior mountain herd or other herds around the West, also in relation to say the bison program in which Yellowtail, you know, was able to bring in bison from Yellowstone in 1936 and 1937. Um, and technically the, that, wild, that herd was wild, but they still had bison herders. They you know, still had folks up there who were feeding them every now and then. Um, the military actually had to airlift in hay in the 1940s because the winter was so bad to the bison herd. But then the bison herd was actually destroyed in the 1960s um, due to fears over brucellosis a bacterial disease that is still present in the Yellowstone bison herd. Um, several years later, the Crow tribe was able to get bison from North Dakota, um, but, the yellow, the, but essentially Yellowtail's Yellowstone bison were destroyed, were completely destroyed. And so in thinking about public debates about rematch matriation. Matriation, so, that's it. <laughs> or, you, know, I, I, you know, you'll see sometimes even the phrase rewilding um, what's really interesting is the conversation here about sovereignty and about where the sort of very entangled relationship between indigenous nations um, and the federal government and state governments comes in. Um, and so I don't have an answer. I don't have a straight answer as to, it, you know, this is the way it looks, other than the sort of typical historians cop out of it's complicated. But I do think that the horse story really sort of demonstrates how, um, you know, it's, it's the goals of, of federal government and the goals of the tribe are, um, you know, 
particularly when it comes to these animals, not going to align. And sovereignty is a huge, huge sticking point. Um, you know, it, yeah, I'll stop okay. there. <laughs> okay, all right. Thanks, Carrie. You have another question from um, Sherry Ladd Lacane, and she says, great talk. Do you think Yellowtail was deliberately playing on the stereotypical view of the crow as closer to their horses, sort of an early horse whisperer concept? So, you see him doing both. You see him both rejecting that at times and then also sort of embracing it. And this is where sort of he, his, uh, selective or very sort of shrewd marketing, um, shrewd marketing and, 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 and uh, skills and negotiation skills come in because there's, you know, in some of his private letters to some of these government officials, he would make sort of gestures to crow culture having deep ties to horses, but he, he didn't sort of engage in sort of these horse whisperer sort of narratives at all. Um, and he's, um, but there are some publications where he sort of engages more in, in some of that, like in some of that a little bit, but he, he was very nuanced in it. It wasn't very essentializing or, or stereotyping at all. Um, but he was, he was, it, it was interesting to see some of his rhetoric change depending on who his audience was. Um, and so he was really good at marketing. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It sounds like he was across the board. Um, you know, I, we have another comment and question from Roberta Bird. And she says, my um, Robert Yellowtail was my great grandfather, great grandfather. And he was around horses well into his later years. He loved them. Thank you. And maybe I get a copy of this to show my dad. So yes, we are recording this and um, so I will send that to you. Um, let's see. We're gonna put it, we're gonna put this recording up on our Extreme History Project YouTube channel. So if you just um, Google that, Roberta, in a you know, in a day or so, it'll be up. And so then you can just um, and whoever else wants to pass it on to friends or family can do that from our Extreme History um, Project YouTube channel. So another person says, awesome presentation. And then we have another question here um, that says, have DNA tests been used to follow bloodlines of horses on the reservation? Oh, well, that's an interesting question. Yeah. So this is also sort of one of those, it's very complicated questions. Um, I'm personally not aware of anyone following the DNA testing of private herds or of personally owned herds on the reservation. There has been some DNA testing on the Fryer Mountain herd. But what's really um, fraught, if you will, about DNA tests is that sometimes they, they, they have their own history. And particularly when one is trying to find what is a wild DNA versus what is a non-wild DNA, that becomes really sort of very historically fraught and complicated and tied up in all of these ideas about who is who 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 gets to belong and who does not get to belong. Um, a book I would recommend if anybody's interested in DNA around indigenous issues would be Kim Talbert's Native American DNA work, um, and so. In terms of like trying to trace where these horses ended up through DNA, that's really difficult simply because we don't have necessarily the DNA of some of these horses from the 1930s. And so, you know, you may, it, it just becomes really fraught. I'm not personally aware of it, but you know, there may be some of that out there. Um, yeah. Okay, all right. Yeah, the good question. Okay, let's see if we have any more here. It looks like that might be it for questions. Um, um, I was just going to make a comment that, you know, if, if folks haven't gone to the real bird, little bighorn battle reenactment, uh, that's a great place to go to see the horsemanship of the Crow Nation. Um, it happens usually during Native American days, which is in the end of June. And I don't know if it'll happen this year, but it probably will happen hopefully again in the future. But um, it's a great place to hear about the horse, um, the story of the horse herd within the Crow Nation and to also witness the horsemanship. Um, I've gone a few times now and it's always 
amazing. So I just wanted to um, tell folks about that too. Um, we might have another question here, just some thank yous um, from folks, but thank you so much, Carrie. That was so fascinating, really very interesting. And <clears throat> I also wanted to say that this article, um, you wrote an article for the Montana Magazine of Western History that focuses on in on this topic as well. And what issue, um, Carrie, is that in that, that article? Is it um, in- Fall of 2020. Fall of 2020. So locate the Montana Magazine of Western History if you want to read more and see all of Carrie's sources as well in that. So thank you so much, Carrie. And thank you to everyone tonight for joining us. It was wonderful to um, have you, to see some, um, some of your names out there, even though we can't see you. Um, Clara Pincus says, fascinating. Thank you. I also enjoyed reading on this topic in the book, Where the Rivers Flow North. So, so that's another one to look for as well. I want, all right, thanks everybody, have a good night and we'll see you again for our next lecture in June. Join us then, good evening. Thanks so much, Carrie. Yeah. That was great. Thank you, this was fun.